there we go. Okay, I thought I'd, this is a kind of a slide I use for not the material I'm giving you, but the covering slide is um, one I use in China now. And I thought I'd show that because um, uh, in the Chinese manner, I was asked to provide a kind of generative slideshow, one that then would be used in different contexts across China, because my appointment with an organization called the Tetao Group, uh, which has very, um, very adventurous, ambitious ideas about education in China, is to develop um, research in art and technology and consciousness in China. So, but I thought I would start really where I began. Um, I was born in the city of Bath in England, rather well known for its 19th century um, architecture and manners, very much like our manners, not, and actually quite like our architecture today. Um, both the manners, the behavior in public and the architecture was all about facade, how it looks, not how it really is, back of the facade. And I can tell you, back of many of the facades of these beautiful crescents, there are some quite appalling architectural um, errors and mistakes, or indifferences, I should say. But um, perhaps more importantly uh, as well is the way in which this city was designed in the 18th century. Uh, it had a kind of um, hermetic design at the back of it, the very famous royal crescent on the top left, uh, 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 the, the uh, circus rather on the top left and the crescent on the bottom right, which are the sort of notable 18th century features of this Georgian architecture actually uh, are conceived as a sort of hermetic code for the sun uh, and the moon. And a lot of the design of the architecture carries this other story, um, which is really not entirely surprising uh, since the landscape all around is made up of significant changes, man-made changes to the environment, um, some thought to be a spoof, uh, you know, the corn uh, patterns on the right, and some undoubtedly there built with real meaning many, many, many millennia ago. In fact, we're only really now beginning to understand uh, the significance of, of, of many, many standing stone structures uh, that pattern the landscape. And at the top, Silbury Hill, and that shape has been rather dominant in my life somehow. It's on a plane, you come across it, this enormous man-made mound, the function of which is totally unknown. It's been excavated three times. It hasn't produced bodies of kings or anything that we would expect. Um, and in its day, um, it would have been chalk covered. It would have been this gleaming white dome in the middle of this green landscape. And to be brought up in that kind of world and all the kind of uh, speculation that goes with it, I think was quite formative. But then I did my military service. I wasn't allowed into art school. I wasn't good enough the first place I tried. I remember the guy sort of chucking my stuff around. But, um, so I had to do my military service. And I thought the best option, actually was a bit of duplicity on my part, was to pretend to want to be a pilot. So you do the pilot training, and then when you get up in the, it's getting permission to get paid more money and more time to play. Um, but, uh, but then once you go up in the plane, you, you sort of get air sick. So they said, well, never mind, you can be a fighter controller, uh, which was a much more interesting job. You, you've seen these old movies where information from radar is coming in, it has to be coordinated. Um, and it's that kind of, uh, what do you call it, tripartite logic? It's not a binary logic. It's bringing three bits of information together to find exactly where that plane is situated. And that sort of thing was rather influential on me in some way. I just love the tabletop. It's been a motif in my life. It's a place of interaction. It certainly was there. And then, of course, back of all of that, with that sort of background I was explaining of the hermetic, even the occult, always been fascinated in the spiritual, even at this sort of crude level of 19th century understanding of what uh, interaction uh, of, of a spiritual kind might be, always around a table, uh, always with uh, the medium uh, being the message, if I dare to quote, <laughs> quote that. Uh, so then, as a student, I had my first psychotic um, uh, episode. In that, I had two very, very powerful and brilliant and wonderful teachers. One was Victor Passmore, a, a lyrical constructivist, you could say, uh, whose interests spread way beyond the constructions on the wall into 
city design and, and so forth. And yet, and on the other hand, um, Richard Hamilton, who's just had a, an enormous retrospective in London, uh, who, of course, did many, many things, was thought to be the father of pop art, but more importantly for me, the, uh, the, the doorway into the mind of uh, Duchamp, who, whom he knew, he translated or, or he um, made a typographical version uh, of the green box, and, uh, and that opened another whole world of mind and possibilities to me. But there, I had these two influences, and, and you know, as a student, you wonder what, which way to go, what it could be. And um, so my solution a little bit was these sort of change paintings, which I show you down there. Cezanne, uh, I had a wonderful teacher, Lawrence Gowing, who was a scholar, who reminded me that, um, that, uh, Duchamp, uh, that, uh, that Cezanne was the first artist, really, we have records of, of being mobile. I mean, his eyesight moved, and as he looked at the landscape, he realized the landscape was moving. Everything was in flux. And so his later paintings, you, you had to interpret. You had to read and make the construction that was fluidly there. If you wanted to halt it in time and space, you could do it. But there it was, as nature is, flowing. And so bringing these things together, I don't know. Anyway, it occurred to me that what I could do is, I was very, also very much impressed by Pollock working on the tabletop on the floor and with gesture and energy and bringing these together on separate panels as one upstairs that the viewer could become participator in the meaning of the work. They could slide the panels. The, the work was infinite. Its meaning never ended, its structure never ended. So that's where, that's how I tried to resolve all that sort of stuff. But um, I want to get back to my point a little bit, um, which is I wanted to talk about interstitial creativity. I wanted to talk about the way we as artists find the gaps in between everything. It's not about interdisciplinary work with science and literature and art. It's finding the gaps in between and making a world out of those gaps in between these knowledge and experience fields, which is what art always has been about, is, is, is always about. And for me, the kind of um, pathways that either open up or allow me to enter into the interstices are these um, thinking systems, you could call them the cybernetics, of the telematic process, uh, of, of, of the syncretic point of view. I, I, I can remind you, if I may, of what that means, the, the origin is from the uh, Greek um, Crete, you know, the island of Crete, where there had many, many tribes with many different ideologies, much like the world we have today, all fighting it out, until the enemy was at the gate, as they say. And at that point, they got together and they said, hey, Rose, this is the way. We've got to get together. We've got to be unified, but we will not lose our distinctive identity. And I think that's, that's the story that of, of the syncretic movement, not just uh, religiously and spiritually, as in some parts of the world, but it can be so intellectually, and I would suggest it could be so politically if you think about it. But anyway, syncretism is important. And then this word I, I was forced to invent. I mean, as you discover or happen upon new behaviors in art, you have to find new language to express it. And so I formed this word technoetic, uh, to bring together the idea of, techne, of, 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 of a te technology in, in its various forms and noesis, uh, consciousness, mind. Uh, because I think um, the, what would characterize mind and perception, now I call it cyberception, Derek was referring to that, uh, is, is this way in which technology amplifies, changes the way we think, the way we can think, the way we see what we can see, and the way we construct and what we construct. But I have to insist that, that techn techno, the techno bet, bet part of that is not simply electronic and digital and so on. It is chemical, it is based in plants in many parts of the world, which are two brought together in very scientific ways, if you will, uh, boiled and cooked and prepared and consumed, and again change perception and consciousness and our ability to think. So that's quite a broad category, technoetic. And, um, yeah, that's, I don't need to give this warning here, I hope, but it's just a warning that we go anywhere. You can't stop us as artists going anywhere with our minds and with our bodies. It's good to have, you used to be able to put it on a passport years ago. Uh, very, very convenient. You can get into any laboratory, any kind of religious organization, you can get into anything if you say, I'm an artist. Because they think, oh, 
this has been a problem. Yeah, go, go, go. But it's useful. Um, what's that? Uh, sorry. Oh, no, that's, uh, that's for the Chinese. Oh, that's, uh, <laughs> sorry, that's those books and stuff. Okay, so I just wanted, I wanted to confer, you know, talk about tabletop. And, uh, okay, so let's go to cybernetics. Now, for me, you know, cybernetics is variously interpreted. I came upon it in terms of biology, actually. Uh, cybernetics of, of, the, of the organism. And it's been the cybernetics of the organism which has been important to me in all my sort of thinking. Um, and, uh, of course, there is a history of it. Forgive me for this. I'd, I'll run through the... You know these things in this audience. But just quickly, I mean, the word has had many interpretations. Uh, one which isn't on there, which I do point out to my Chinese friends, is in 19... I think it was 1970, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union uh, decided to have cybernetics as its kind of theme for, uh, for a five-year plan. And uh, they did a number of things. And by bringing cybernetics to their consideration of um, shelters and uh, movement of transport, things like this, which had also been done, by the way, in Chile. Uh, that's another story. Uh, but they also reinstated, interestingly, into the Department of Cyber Biological Cybernetics a very distinguished parapsychologist who had been banned by Stalin and kicked out, uh, Vasilia, who was then brought back into play uh, to contribute to the development of thinking of, of, of mind and consciousness. I thought that was rather interesting. But anyway, here are the, here are the main players that we all know about. We all know that, that cybernetics was a great idea. We understand the world in terms of interactive systems until, uh, really, Gregory Bates and Margaret Mead first, but most notably, Heinz von Forster, 1974, came along and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're not really understanding the world as system unless we know we are in it. We're no longer going to be the scientist in the white coat who steps back and looks at it. We're going to be, we understand the system as involving the observer. Most of your art now does that precisely, of course. You involve the observer as a participator in your work. And um, so that's just a cloud you'll see it upstairs. So I try to set this out within their community, the cybernetics people community, and the issues that I wanted to raise to suggest were important in art practice were behavior, identity, chance, change, process, system, interaction, and transformation. And that has been quite useful, kind of almost a passage uh, of, of in developing ideas when I work with people. Oh, that's just the show I had in Shanghai. And there is like a video, but I bet I can't make it work. Uh, it kind of just walks through this exhibition. But what was nice that was this, um, the blackboard came from a series of uh, Rudolf Steiner blackboards. There was a huge gallery, Rudolf Steiner blackboards. And then, hey, we rather naughtily had mine blown up. <laughs> they confront you as you went to my gallery. But um, that, this is like just, uh, uh, it's just walking through the gallery. So we'll, we'll just move on a little bit. So the, 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 that blackboard, which is also uh, upstairs, by the way, it's already been interacted with. Um, tilt became tits, you could imagine, right? And uh, what was the other one? <laughs> condom. Oh, yes, random became condom. So, I thought, okay, okay. If you open up to the public interactively, that's what you get. But that was early on in the 60s, trying to, just trying to sort of show, actually to a group of students, a, a relationship between chance, the possibilities of genetic code. Even then, we didn't know too much about it. But the idea of programming and chance and, and so on and so forth, it was an attempt to do, deal with that. Um, so that, that's that passage I, I was talking about. I think always is usefully applied. I call it the five-fold path in the way Buddhists have their, their paths. And, and so we start with connectivity of minds and so on. We become immersed in another world, um, either a total immersion or immersed in Facebook. It doesn't matter. But we become immersed in this sort of world. There's interaction takes place. The important thing then is transformation, either of what's on the screen through our participation, what's in the structure because of our participation, or the transformation in the mind because of our participation. And the really significant part of this process is emergent, that art that we're engaged in is emergent, either physically emergent, changing, 
or emergent in meaning. The meaning shifts. Meaning is not stable in our culture. And I think that's a richness because it makes for well, greater participation. <coughs> sorry. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, translator. I will do that. Okay, so, so anyway, there, here's some of these change paintings that I was talking about. The other thing, um, I was very, very happy when um, Denebiva and Arts Electronic and everyone involved in this exhibition upstairs said, um, you know, we want some analog work. Actually, it was in Winnipeg, uh, quite an expensive proposition to bring the work here. And I said, yes, because they said it, it is, it's not just about electronic, or what it, it's, it is this cybernetic uh, work that's moved through what you've been doing. This piece is actually in the Tate, and guess what? We couldn't get it here. Um, but I think this little page from a catalog from when it was shown is trying to explain to you uh, how I was trying to develop metaforms, that forms that have, not just mine, but pointing out that so many forms in art have the richness and complexity and openness and emergent properties of meaning that metaphors have in language, in, t in literature and so on. Uh, so I, I produced the catalog then as a bit of a handbook and of course, some of the work was a little bit literal. I mean, in a way, this piece um, was a homage to see Shannon. We all know, you know, schoolboy stuff, that you have the communication in one mode uh, and, and it's received in another mode, but you have noise in between. The process in cybernetics when we don't know, I love this bit, we call it the black box. So I know nothing about motor cars, I drive them brilliantly. But the black box is the black box. I don't need to know this pedal does this and that. And the same very much in very complex systems, as many of our programmers and friends will know. There are bits that you do not need to know. You plug it in, you pass through it. And I think that's a significant metaphor, the black box anyway. And drawings and stuff like that. All these pieces trying to deal with metaphors. And by implication, you see these little sliding bits that you can move around, not in that one, uh, implying that you can bring various levels of meaning together in a painting. And then I made a number of these pieces, which were like templates, not the thing in itself. I was very interested in, in a work of art, not, as like, it's a, it not being the thing in itself, but being the potential for a thing, which is what a template or pattern is, and the paintings and stuff. And uh, so this, this was, again, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, Eddie was talking about uh, sort of philosophy and stuff being brought in, and well, it's not philosophy, I know exactly, but this idea that within a, an exhibition catalog, one can lay out the social, uh, even political implications of, of this cybernetic uh, way of thinking about the world of, uh, and on various kinds of levels. But here's the man, here's the man. <laughs> this is Stafford Beer. Uh, Stafford Beer was hired by Allende, uh, did wonderful things. I mean, the most notable was that he brought the gross national product reporting down to practically a day, actually a week compared to the West where it takes three months from the data from all sources to be gathered, interpreted, and read out as what the gross national product would be for a period. So we've always got a time lag of three months. Allende had a time lag of one week, and the changes, the transformation of the economy with that understanding was very, so significant, one could say, no, that, not that reason alone, but so significant that the that let's say a very powerful Western power uh, decided to murder him, as you know, um, uh, Allende that is. Uh, and, and that ended the opportunity for Stafford Beer, this brilliantly insightful um, cyberneticist to bring uh, cybernetic thinking and planning into the social sphere. And his wonderful uh, cyber control system was actually um, rebuilt recently and um, exhibited in England. But anyway, I, I, I recommend him to you if you're not familiar with his work. So, okay. Um, so then I just wanted to make the point about interaction in science, because we all depend a lot, of, I depend on the metaphors of science. I have no understanding of mathematics or chemistry in any formal technical sense. I have to say that I do have a very great appreciation of the metaphors uh, that science provides. And particularly in a period when I was much younger, when there was, we, we were trying to theorize our practice. There were no historians, there were no critics, there was no nobody, there were no eddies, <laughs> for example, to, to theorize the practice. Um, we did it ourselves, which is why I set up this research center as well. 
Um, uh, but, um, but, the, but the scientists provide us with very useful metaphors about interaction. But I always love the way that they, are, if, you, if you Google them, um, you'll find they always come up with a blackboard. And I think there's a very good reason for that. And that is that you, you, when you're presenting theories to young, brilliant minds, you will get questions. You will have answers. You will make changes. You will rub something out. You say, well, we could try this. It's all about sort of interaction with the group of minds to, to arrive, even though the solution is probably known to allow them to arrive at a solution. So I think it, it's interesting. I thought I'd present the people like Dirac, less, uh, less Einstein, frankly, but certainly Paul Dirac, and absolutely um, uh, Ross Ashby, uh, th uh, th to remind us, really, of their value, certainly to signal their value to me. Um, and it, it was actually Ross Ashby who I first by whom I first encountered uh, in cybernetics, rather than Norbert Wiener and so on. It was a biological model, and a wonderfully eccentric Englishman, as you see, as well, over there. But um, so these people, Forster I've talked about, Heisenberg and so on, and John Wheeler above all. I nearly got close to his metaphor talking before about the world. It was he who said, um, we used to think that the world exists out there independently of us, uh, we, the observers, safely hidden behind a one-foot-thick slab of plate glass, not getting involved, only observing. However, we've concluded in the meantime that that isn't the way the world works. In fact, we have to smash the glass and reach in. And that whole principle uh, of the, uh, what's it called, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, where measuring, observing, looking, constructs the reality effectively, is our model. That's, that's our model, that's what we're doing with artists. We provide the possibilities, the viewer constructs what becomes a reality. So they've been very useful to us. And of course, there's the great diagram of them all. <laughs> the great iconic diagram, I think, of transformation uh, that, that, that is provi provided by, by Duchamp's uh, work. Um, so, and then, well, quickly to say, because I have to, otherwise there will be arguments, people fighting in the audience, stuff about the uh, Copenhagen interpretation, that we also have the many worlds, uh, Hugh Everett III's many worlds interpretation, that every moment, <coughs> smack, crack, bubble, as the, as, the, as, the, um, uh, uh, as the quantum effects create new worlds all the time, new realities all the time. But hey, it came in, it became popular, it became attended to, rather much historically, as a matter of fact, at the point that um, virtual worlds, particularly Second Life, remember, that commercial enterprise um, came into being. Just about the same time as we started building worlds, that one became popular as a quantum model, I thought that was. And so here are the criminals. I thought I should identify, having seen the good guys, these are the, this is the criminal line. They haven't yet been, uh, you know, processed uh, in the appropriate way, but um, there they are. Um, and uh, a, enormous sort of hate figures, really, I suppose you could say, to be absolutely honest, those who restrict the flow of ideas about the world, about consciousness, who think that that's all there is. It's naive, it's childish, but they're in very powerful positions and they have very loud voices. And of course, they're backed enormously by corporations and universities who are insistent, uh, basically, um, upon the idea, which I find absolutely childish, that all the meat jiggling around in the head produces, produces consciousness. Um, as distinct from that more intelligent model, which the rest of the world understands, that consciousness is a field, uh, as space is a field, and the brain is an organ that has been evolved to access that field. And I think that's a fundamental difference between us. But these are terribly dangerous people, and I thought I'd <laughs> identify. Yeah, okay. And then we have the wonderful Max Planck. You know, he doesn't mess about. Think of Facebook with Max Planck on it every day. Mind is the matrix of all matter. Thanks. Next one. You know, <laughs> wonderful. There is no such, there is no matter as such. And, um, and so it goes on. Hans-Peter Dorr, uh, who's still very much with us, and Heisenberg in spirit. Um, and so, and, and of course, the, the, the saint of our world, John S. Bell, who not only talked about it, but demonstrated thought faster than the speed of light. Uh, with his quantum experiment. So there, there they all are. And I would recommend you, to you that account, if you're unf un unfamiliar with it, How the Hippies Save Physics. Um, some of those guys are friends of mine. I was with them in the Bay Area, just the point that this was happening, that, that everything, you know, because of, I can't give the talk now, but I mean, because of the US military 
position, it was forbidden. People were fired, including Bell ended up in some, well, I shouldn't say disrespectfully, but some hick technical college somewhere in the sticks. He was moved. Most of them were moved out of academia who held this position of, uh, that we're talking about. Uh, uh, and physics, uh, quantum physics, had simply to deal with this sort of materialist uh, process, which was enormously useful, but not the metaphysical speculation. Forbidden, forbidden. But here, these guys were doing it. And then, of course, without understanding that there is no ultimate world, the world is constructed by the senses that uh, we're, we've got. Oh, I was going to say we're given, I shouldn't say that. But anyway, we've, we've generated or whatsoever. Um, and snails have one world, lions have another world, Fred has his world, Mary has, their, I have my world, all different worlds. So telematics, and uh, this was one of the first pieces. Um, uh, I, I've got to say that one of my great friends, uh, Robert Adrian, who lives in Vienna, has been hugely important to me, uh, and Heidi, his wife, uh, in, well, I think even coming to know Ars Electronica in the very first place. I, I don't think he's here, but um, he's the most lovely and important man whose who's understanding of the implication uh, of this field was very, very useful and helpful to me. Uh, and anyway, uh, it was his um, embassy in Canada, uh, from where he originates, that actually put up the funding to do this first piece of what I call distributed authorship, which Eddie has kindly referred to. Uh, but basically to bring these people together in telematic space uh, using uh, 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 the IP Sharp network. It was, uh, various networks. So, um, oh, and now we've got, probably got something. Um, ah, yes, yeah, sorry, if I can possibly show this very briefly to you. Um, but, yeah, so well, actually this is dealing, I think, with the... Um, well, basically, the reason I'm showing this is a group of very, very, very uh, skillful and, and creative uh, group of uh, artists came together with me to produce a new generation of Laplace du text, which we've shown in various biennales and places uh, for the last couple of years, in which um, we invited um, the construction of the worlds in text itself, as well as uh, giving the opportunity for avatars to contribute textual work, as well as trying to, not terribly successfully, you see these green, uh, blue letters along the bottom, where we were, were trying to develop a way in which with the hand, with the, with the iPhone, you could, in real time, you could also uh, become an avatar and enter into the conversation. We didn't get to the point where the avatars could be built so fast, but we did get the text. But the point was to inhabit this other world, virtual, these virtual worlds which were occurring, whether they were a second life or whatever they were, uh, and so on. And I tried to use this in my show in the in Shanghai Biennale. I, I opened up La Plisse du Text, which had been 12 or 14 characters from fairy tale, um, developing a story from their own viewpoint across three weeks in telematic space to uh, amplifying it to be uh, authors, uh, as it were, taking on the identity of, of uh, Eastern um, uh, mythological characters as well, and using um, simply uh, uh, an online uh, exchange of, of messages just flowing through the system in the gallery all the time. And then here, of course, was wonderful uh, Ars Electronica uh, enabled and financed this this uh, project uh, which basically uh, was the celebration of Gaia we sent out messages using all kinds and uh, Godfrey last night referred very kindly to that I won't go into great depths but basically getting ideas of what constitutes the earth Gaia from many many sources and feeding them back to us either looking down on a number of horizontal uh, tabletop things one can interact with or going through the womb of Kaya in this wonderful railway they built um, that had all these uh, textual messages that you could could look through and so on and um, uh, so then let, let's then let, let's look at some as other aspects quickly I'd remind you of use the internet relative to the body this will be very familiar to you um, this was my student uh, Paul Sermon who one of the f one of the first uh, interactive uh, Golden Nakers um, with his piece, very, very imaginative piece of telematic dreaming. It's been so popular all the way around the world, the idea that, uh, you know, you can see what the idea is. 
coming together through telematic space and so on. And then came moist media, um, and this, uh, you know, the wired and the wet, the material, um, silicon dry computational systems joined with biological wet, so it produces moist media. And um, I applied that, uh, actually it was in Graz 2000 that uh, Richard Kreischer very kindly invited me to curate an exhibition of moist media. So a moist media is a good idea, so an exhibition, great. Uh, wait a minute, there's only three artists in the world who are doing it, we, can't, we don't really have an exhibition. If he were to ask me that now, I would be overwhelmed with the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of artists who are working with biological art and so on and so forth. But I, at that time, tried to rationalize it and apply it to all these kinds of other outputs, um, and that was the Graz thing. All I could do was to put up the manifesto. But now, this is just a few people I pulled out to really to remind, I don't probably need to remind uh, you all that, but, um, you know, really, it starts, I suppose, with Symbiotica actually locating their studio in a bio lab. Uh, you know, no messing, not go visiting, no could you let us, you know, you know but that's taking uh, up residence in that place. That's their base and working with, with, uh, with living systems in various kinds of ways. That's just some of the artists. Of course, there are now hundreds and hundreds of artists working that way. But then most notably, I think, and most beautifully for me, this uh, uh, moist media is coming together with, with nature uh, and mind and so on it is exemplified particularly in the work of um, uh, Victoria Vesna and uh, Jim Jim, Jim Jusky, who is uh, hopefully here, uh, if he is, because I like to pay tribute to, to what they're doing. They really are representing this coming together of art and science in a way that often you don't get. You often get you know, someone drawn in for a grant with some old retired professor of biology and some bright young thing, and they write the spiel. Actually, it's like using illustration material from science and dressing it up a bit. An awful lot of money has gone down the drain that way. But some really inspired projects of really science and art coming together into a new sort of thing, I think, is we certainly find it here. And I love particularly that... Uh, that this very, very famous uh, new, um, uh, nano scientist, uh, uh, Jim Javuski, also sees the relationship on a spiritual level uh, and relates, as you see there, his work with Buddhists and so on. So anyway, I won't go on too much about that, but they have produced some, <coughs> some very transcendental work. And um, so, uh, yeah, I like this point. You so say, I'm going to introduce Thomas Ray. Thomas Ray marks the fulcrum between the old media art and the new media, if I can put it in that way. Because he about, actually it was 10 or 12 years ago, I was there in, in, in Tucson at this, towards the Science of Consciousness conference where um, uh, Tom Ray um, had, uh, actually I should move on to, to why I'm saying this. He, he was the, uh, he was the guru. He, he did the A-Life, he did the first A-Life work, you know, on the screen. <clears throat> and um, his piece, uh, Tierra, is very, very, very famous. And then, as I say, 10 or 12 years ago, he switched his research to the brain, where it all happens, to consciousness. Um, and whoops, it's moved. Um, and uh, where he actually identified, I think it was nine uh, new sort of neural pathways that, chemis that chemicals could open up, new fields of experience and feeling that new kinds of uh, neural pathways um, could, could uh, create. And that was quite, I mean, all those scientists were in front of him as he presented that. It was quite a, a moment. But I, this is the shift, and it's my prediction, for what it's worth, um, that the next 30 to 50 years will see a transition to chemistry from, uh, always the computer will be used, the electronic media, but our, our, cont our, our ars electronica then will be ars chemica, because I think we will be looking at the ways in which chemistry can alter perception and consciousness, um, and, I, and I think he, he, he points uh, in that direction. That's another sort of thing. But so th there's a whole history of these. Of course, here, one of my, two of my, well, certainly Krista graduated from our planetary collegium and Lauren was, was involved. Uh, this wonderful piece, I think, I don't know why this slips, um, uh, which I, I think was uh, of, of its period, the absolute definitive interactive work where uh, you, you can create a form, uh, you can marry forms together, they produce an offspring, but, and also extremely beautiful, if I dare use that word, uh, beautiful piece. Uh, anyway, so I, 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 I'm not, I, can't, I mustn't go on to all of this, this is another lecture, but just to point out, there are many, many models of science 
um, and many, many ways that artists are working with the, the body, and of course there's some more famous and, um, uh, and so on than others, and so on and so forth. But really to make the point that um, this, is, this is where we are now. The planet is telematic, our media is moist, our mind is technoetic, our sensorium is extended, our identity is multiple, our body is transformable, our art is syncretic, our substrate is, kind of will be, is, will be, nano, and our reality is variable. Um, so really, it brings me to, you know, what is the, what is our culture now? We've moved out of uh, postmodernism. That was an interesting interlude, uh, where we said that the artist doesn't produce content anymore. The artist produces the context with which we, in which we interact and produce meaning ourselves. Um, and uh, there's greater emphasis on process than the non-object. We become immersed rather than standing apart from the world. Um, telenoia, celebration of telematic connectivity replaces that old private paranoia of the 19th and early 20th century, and so on and so on, until now when we're looking at uh, construction, we're really beginning to think about architecture as horticulture, architecture where we seed buildings that grow grow, not, not kind of, but actually grow relative to changes in their environment, um, and products that grow out of systems that we have just as we grow plants and so forth. In a kind of way, we see that even now uh, with the ways that we can create three-dimensional structures telematically, as you know. Anyway, just to point out that we, we are in the middle of an enormous cultural shift, and what people are doing, what we are doing in our field, I think contributes to that significantly. Then the question of the organism, <clears throat> uh, to point out that I understand art as an organism, and I think we need to respond to these organisms that we're producing of participatory interactive systems as art, to the other institutions um, <clears throat> in the world, notably um, them. But always bearing in mind, it seems to me, this is a warning that I would give uh, respectfully to everyone, that um, that art which is art is not art. And that art, which is not art, is art. Um, pretty much, I think that's the case. Um, I can't go in great detail. I suggest you might want to go up and stairs and look more detail. But I have developed over the years, some years now, uh, a, an approach to the art situa as an organism, uh, trying to bring into the consciousness of students that they can be part of a participatory whole and that these organic wholes can can be very productive, and so I, I won't go into detail about it, but I still wanted to point to that. Um, I've been fired many times, <laughs> I should make that clear. Um, and I, 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 di I didn't think anybody would be making any job offers anyway, but, um, <laughs> but I have. But one of the most notable, notable firings I enjoyed was from the Ontario College of Art. Um, I was a little young, so young I was wearing shades just for protection, if you don't mind me. 34 years old. The biggest art college in North America, they just have a student revolution. They were a few years late, of course, uh, 1968, but this was 1970s Canada, with great respect. But hey, uh, so they wanted a radical. And I'd come out of London as a radical. I was actually, I had, it really worked like that in those days. A friend phoned me up, was on a lecture tour in Canada, said, hey, Roy, they're looking for a president at the San Francisco, for the Ontario College of Art. Come on down for the interview. Nah, what's that, president? We didn't call them that. Anyway, I went down with my shades with this huge thing and gave a lecture, and they said, right, you got it. I won't go into all the story. So immediately, I created this structure with a group of really brilliant, not just Canadian, but brilliant Canadian and North American uh, people who, who kind of emerged. <laughs> uh, and we developed this, this project this for the whole school that everything would be built uh, on the axes of information or structure or concept. And we would apply to each of those poles the idea of speculation there and ask, in other words, what can we talk about as a social application of structure? Or what do we talk about as a theory of information? And then we break that down into many, many subcategories. And then we look at all the teachers we got and all the rooms we got. We put out this thing, the students tick off the things which is, hey, You've got a kind of a curriculum, you've got a kind of a, a, a thing. What we didn't have at that time was a computer. And I have to say, the human mind without a computer can't really cope with that kind of, that kind of number of people. But anyway, so, and this then, uh, I applied some thinking to the, um, 
to this. It was a team uh, that uh, Hannah's brought together of, of about six or seven of us to try to think about the museum of the future. Um, that was my the various sort of levels. I, I did want that big, big facade where all people working rooms would be, be visible as a stage. That was architecturally a bit difficult. But it was a wonderful opportunity to think about um, the sort of way you deal with media flow uh, and the opportunity for the public and for the creative uh, people to come together in one house. And now we've got this absolutely wonderful set of structures which um, have now been developed. But that thinking that I was invited to do or obliged to do or did uh, for it has been served to be very useful to me in constructing uh, either the organism uh, that would be an answer, as, as it is now as I work in China. It was very, very helpful for me with those colleagues to, to get a thinking about what uh, these institutional structures might be and, and how they, they might work and so on. And now this wonderful uh, outcome. And, and my televator, which I, I treasure, um, I won't go and describe it now, but um, uh, that, that, that was fun. And then I applied it equally, that thinking, uh, a little bit, uh, more to Nabi in Korea, um, and very much there with wormholes. I think the, the wormhole is not exploited enough in universities, where you can get directly to that other reality, directly to that other campus, no messing, not sort of, I mean, Skype is tragic in its way. <laughs> it's tragic. Well, we'll see in a few years how sad it all was, and um, particularly there's never enough bandwidth. All, all the ills of the present society will be solved in 20 or 30 years, I hope. But meanwhile, we can do our best working with these ways, I think, uh, of, of knowledge building. And not to forget, I don't to this need to remind this audience, we have a real problem, a, a huge problem on our hands, that schools are full uh, of uh, digital natives being taught by digital immigrants, immigrants who don't understand the language, don't understand the manners, don't understand the food, they're called the teachers. <laughs> and they have to have the students to show them how to, <laughs> to do what they want to do. And all the forms that those teachers have learned over the centuries now, presenting knowledge, uh, don't work. Uh, and all the forms that the students are generating for accessing knowledge and building ideas do work for them. And there's this awful divide. So we have enormous social problems on our hands. Um, and particularly with the universities, which are as divisive now, uh, as budget fighting machines as they ever were. And uh, instead, I think we need completely new organisms of inquiry. And I think it's you guys, the, you people, the, the sort of artists that this world represents who have the skills, the knowledge of technology, of, of interactivity, all the things that this work is about and that Ars Electronica supports so brilliantly. These are, these are ways of thinking which are gonna be, which are hugely important in forming these new organisms. But we must prioritize, in my view, in our culture, subject before object, process before system, behavior before form, intuition before reason, and mind before matter. Otherwise, we're condemned to the life of those four criminals I put up in front of you. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's just to go a little bit further about all that sort of thing. So the planetary collision is an attempt to bring minds together and practices together, and uh, I don't know if we can play that uh, very brief, if I can, I will, but um, uh, if I can. This is a design for a node. I mean, the, the, there's a lot of intimacy in these research groups. You can't have more than 15 or 16 researchers together at any one time, so I wanted a node designed that would be able to carry information and transmit it, and so on. This is just one idealistic project that, that came out of it, but the, that's where we're located at the moment in various cities and uh, in each one there's a node of about 15 researchers with, with directors of studies and so on. And that's the one I'm setting up in China, it opens on Monday uh, with a team I brought together um, uh, over there and uh, these are sort of topics that we will be addressing that we were weaving into the syllabus and that's where we are in, um, it's about a, a, a 45 minutes out of downtown Shanghai in a big uh, campus thing. And this is to point out, this is the, um, this is the organization called Ditao. And it's just a, it's just a point, uh, I don't really know that it's entirely 
pertinent here, but what they're doing is they're bringing a lot of notable architects and designers into China, not to get, not to teach Chinese uh, design, uh, students and so how to build stuff like they have built, but to, to transmit their creativity, the processes by which they get to their ideas in these fields. And I think that's pretty important. And then just to get back to what I was talking about, um, and I think the proof of the pudding will be in architecture. It's in architecture we're going to see the flowering of everything that is seeded in these interactive systems and, and in the sort of art practices that you all are engaged in, uh, where we actually start, if you like, growing art, certainly growing architecture. I'm not talking about these sort of ideas of bottom-up design. I'm talking about literally planting seeds in the earth that grow. This is nanotechnology when it grows up. Um, just as everything we do in artificial life uh, and in virtual worlds is just a rehearsal for what we will actually do when uh, material science comes of age, when we can actually build materials to behave in ways we actually want them to, not try to play around with natural materials to make them do things they don't really want to do. Uh, so all that comes on board. And I've talked about technoethics and syncretism, cyber deception. Just to remind you that there's not just multimedia, new media, moist media, there's neuromedia, geo, all these medias, all these fields uh, are coming into play uh, with something that we can begin to play with. And just to say that these things produce various kinds of reality um, that, we, that we negotiate. We have, we have like validated reality. Uh, that's that VR which we learned, you know, uh, this idea you drop an apple or whatever it was that Newton did or shoot an arrow in somebody's head or something, has material consequences, you know, material causality. And then we have virtual reality, uh, which is interactive but digital and telematic and immersive. The vegetal reality I'm, re I'm, I'm pointing to is that consumption of plants, uh, and nowadays it will be uh, psychoactive materials uh, that create another kind of reality. And altogether, what's, the reason I point about this is a few years ago, you went into virtual, you sort of went into one section of these realities with head. But now we're, we're I don't have my phone on me. My God, the first time I don't have my phone on me for several years. Um, it's there, thank God. But, um, you know, it's, we're there all the time. Where are we? We're always in all these realities. It's seamless now. We don't go into one or the other. It's a variable reality we're engaged in. So that's the sort of uh, world that I think, um, that's the sort of map of it. And I put it upstairs so you can see that to, to, uh, to talk about this. And um, another point to point out, I have, I'm probably vastly overrun the time that I have. Have I? Or? I've got to close now. Oh. 80 more years. <laughs> okay. So really just to point out that um, another fascinating man on, on, you know, hostage, really, he's put as a hostage of fortune in a way, uh, is, is uh, Fritz Albert Popp. Um, and um, he, he has an interpretation of biophysics, which I find absolutely fat. Well, not more an interpretation, a practice. He, he, he proves what he's doing, which is that, um, uh, that DNA molecules emit photons. Um, hey, that's interesting, because uh, there ain't any sun actually in the body as far as we know. It doesn't get further than skin. He's not talking about photons from the sun. He's talking about the system generating photons. Why? To provide an information system for the body. That's really fascinating to me, um, I think, because in a way it sort of mirrors, it's a continuation of precisely the photons and electrons that we have structuring, as it were, the planet, the body of the planet. Uh, but I, I do recommend to you the research um, um, of uh, Fritz Albert Popp uh, in Neuss. And those of you who might be interested in biophysics and really examining, for artists, very interesting. There are some working with it. The consequences of this, you can go, actually he has these workshops of about 10 days in Neuss in, in the summer, very worthwhile experiencing <clears throat> the apparatus that he set up to work with and measure these uh, photonic uh, emissions. But <clears throat> it's just by, by the way a little bit. Yeah, just to make the point though, I mean, you know, scientists are very keen on telling us they know damn all about the universe, it's probably true. 78% uh, of it is dark matter, no idea what it is. Uh, and hey, when you get to the body, they said, well, there's all this DNA, we don't know what it is, there's all this rubbish DNA. As if nature was so stupid to have us carrying around 
useless DNA. Why? It's ridiculous. What we, what they, what one does say, can't say, is we have absolutely no idea of what is there. So, but, but not only though, it's the same below, it's same above, but they don't know anything about consciousness. Absolutely nothing. So, 700 people every two years, 700 scientists all over the world, particularly from the States, gather in Tucson to talk about consciousness. They get nowhere with it because they're all trying to understand how the, how the brain creates consciousness rather than how the brain accesses it. And in other parts of the world, there's no such problem. But anyway, we have these researches, but hey, this comes from a culture. Um, this is the Shipibo people who actually wear their beliefs on their faces <laughs> and on their buildings. But um, um, this is a, a technology which, um, uh, you know, is, is a very precise uh, biotechnology about changing consciousness, about, about the mind navigating these areas of consciousness which the Enlightenment in Europe has forbidden um, uh, to us, us to access. Um, I just point to it briefly, but there are, you know, many, 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 many cultures built around this. Uh, this is the point I would make, that we might expect art to develop across two principal axes, technoetic connectivity, which we're familiar with, and cultural syncretism, which we, we, we haven't yet found a way to really interpret, um, and then chemical mapping of the brain and the mind navigated by, well, not just plant technology. But I think this will bring us as conduits to other states of consciousness, which is the history of art. Art is all about bringing us to other states of consciousness. Um, but then, just to make this point, really, that you know, we have this, what I would call first order of the senses, sight, hearing, touch, smell, so on, that Aristotle identified. Uh, but there is a second order senses, just we have second order cybernetics. And um, I, sorry, th th those who've heard me talk, forgive me, this pun comes every time, I can't resist it. But if you're in a faculty meeting, or if you're in a high level business meeting, and you wanna clear the room, or you want them to clear you out of the room, just use any one of those words. <laughs> End of story. <laughs> End the story. Um, they're all absolutely verboten, if I can use the local word. Um, and yet they are so real to so many hundreds and thousands of peoples and hundreds of cultures throughout the world today. <laughs> Sorry, guys, we can't say, you know, five millennia ago, today. So maybe worth examining. In some way, they have some utility, I think. Um, anyway, I won't go there, though. The CNA, as you know, sort of played around for a while, invested quite a lot of money uh, into examining some aspects of it. Um, and even, you know, this out-of-body experience, oh, I thought I had a slide, yeah. Um, there are labs now, started off in Brazil, now in Portugal and other places, actually trying to examine the idea of out-of-body experience and so on. So anyway, just a point to that. And finally, uh, to make the point about the, sort of the consequence of all this with living in the world today, it seems to me that more and more we are generating a sense of the multiple self. We're no longer a single self uh, organism. Uh, and before I get into that, I must bear witness to, you know, in my sort of world, there's, there's um, um, you know, there's, there's like Duchamp uh, and there's Pollock and they're great figures, but up there in, in art is also Fernando Pessoa, uh, the national poet of Portugal who created these heteronyms, these avatars, with completely complete uh, life stories, who wrote in completely different styles, uh, were politically active, with letters to the president, manifestations and so on, and they were all aspects of Pessoa. And I like this quotation where he says, uh, where we say, through his creation of het uh, heteronyms, Fernando Pessoa affirmed his belief that a man cannot possibly live and fully understand life by being only one person, but you must lead simultaneous lives to achieve this higher understanding. I think that's precisely what we're on the brink of now with the sort of media that we're developing, of, of, uh, of um, uh, if we say, heteronyms or avatars, of putting ourselves out there in, in these other worlds. By the way, uh, he also had access to what we would call other worlds, just as 
um, uh, other artists have, have hinted at, but I won't go there at the moment. But this is to tell you what you know. This is all old material anyway. But uh, certainly, um, you know, there are generations of young people as well as really old people <laughs> like myself, but who are, are taking on these multiple selves and, and, and living with them in, in various parts of their social realities. I love this slide. Um, this is one person's five avatars meeting together. <laughs> but um, I think the richness of that is when you think that, what are we talking, 30 years, maybe 50 years, that artificial intelligence uh, will be brought into, um, into these uh, virtual worlds, that each of these avatars will have some minimal intelligence. Then what, it, then what are we? We're, we're, um, we're managing multiple selves. We'll be managing multiple selves because, of course, other things like education, um, uh, work, <laughs> profit making, culture building, um, physical, but all of this will be subject to completely new thinking about our relationship to the material world, uh, to the spiritual world, to the, to, the, to the connectivity between us. And within that, I think we will have multiple avatars who can, in a certain sense, think for themselves or they'd be responsible to us. So I think that's something a little bit worth thinking about. And it's kind of very meaning to, to many people today. So no longer a, 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 a single self-organism. And those are some of the questions. I won't bore you with them now, so that's a bit of an end of a lecture thing. But there are lots of questions that our practice, well, thank God, our practices generate questions. Many, many, many questions. They don't pacify. Our work doesn't pacify. Our work doesn't sort of put you in uh, somnambulistic states. Um, it forces you to, to rethink your perceptions, to rethink possibilities. I think that's the richness uh, of, of interactive uh, art. And I think this is why th this wonderful organization that's uh, hosting this event, um, uh, Ars Electronica, is really so important. Bringing all, all of you, all of us together with these sort of attitudes, I think is really, really important. Hey, that's me. And, um, oh, no, no, that's not. Oh, oh, my goodness, they managed to get in there again. That's my Chinese hosts. Um, oh, wow. Okay, they get everywhere. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks.